and then here's the power point. Okay, so it's recording, and this is how I know. Okay. All right, class, so today we're going to talk about chapter 41, which is intraoral imaging. Our learning objectives today are to pronounce, define, and spell the key terms. Explain the reasons that the number of images is an FMX might vary. Name the two primary types of projections used in an intraoral technique and discuss the paralleling technique, including the following. State the five basic rules. Uh, describe how to prepare a patient for digital uh, dental imaging. Explain why an image receptor holder is necessary with the paralleling technique and describe the sequence of exposure for anterior and posterior teeth. So, <clears throat> it is possible for every dental assistant to successfully produce quality dental images that are free from distortion with the correct density and contrast that can be used for the detection of dental disease. Create such images by carefully following the proper steps in image receptor placement, exposure, and processing. Your technique will vary depending on whether you are using digital sensors, phosphor storage plates, or conventional dental film. Your patients will come in a variety of sizes, physical and mental abilities, types of dentitions, and personalities. You will have to modify your technique if your patient has a palate that is very high and narrow, or if your patient has a sensitive gag reflex. I also mentioned to you guys yesterday in lab that if patients have what's called torize, you will probably have to change the way you're taking x-ray on that patient. Now the steps to quality dental images are placement, exposure, processing, and then you want those quality uh, radiographs. And usually we take radiographs to detect dental disease, okay, dental caries, perio, things like that. Full mouth survey, or known as an FMX. So this is what you guys have been taking, and for most of you, you are on the third FMX. At this time, we have um, set the timer. You guys need to take an FMX under 15 minutes. Um, some of you did it, some of you didn't. And now I'm going to tell you why. In a few minutes, it's all about sequence. So no dental examination is complete without dental images. And in almost all cases, the full mouth survey is the most preferred technique. An intraoral uh, intra FMX contains periapical and bite wing images. On the bite wing, it shows the upper and lower teeth in occlusion. Only the crowns and a small portion of the root of the teeth are seen. The view is used for detecting interproximal decay, periodontal disease, and recurrent decay under restorations, as well as the fit of metallic fillings or crowns. A bite wing will also show the crestal bone. And here is an example of a bite wing. So if you look at this x-ray here, okay, this x-ray shows premolars and molars. Okay, so here's the maxillary and here's the mandibular. On these x-rays here, this white signifies amalgam fillings, okay? And we're actually uh, next week gonna start charting what we see on x-rays. So for instance, if I tell you what do you see on this x-ray, you're gonna write occlusal amalgam filling, same thing here. On top of which you're gonna need to know the teeth. So back here, you barely can see it, but back here is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. You know your fourth one is your premolar. On your premolar, this is a distal occlusal amalgam filling. Coming down, this is number 32. We barely can see it again. I see a little tiny amalgam filling on it. This is number 31, 30, 29. On 29, distal occlusal. Remember, surface away from the midline. Here we also have a distal occlusal, and here we have a mesial occlusal closest to the midline. Okay, so you're going to need to know how to chart. Again, we'll start doing that. Uh, we did a little bit, but we're going to go more into depth next week. 
The periapical image shows the entire tooth from the occlusal surface or incisal edge to about two to three millimeters beyond the apex to show the periapical bone. This view is used to diagnose pathologic conditions of the tooth, root, and bone, as well as tooth formation and eruption. Periapical views are essential in the endodontics and oral surgery procedures. So here is an example. In A, this is an anterior where you'll see the central, the lateral, and the canine. Here in B, here's number one. It looks like it's impacted too. It's all the way up here. Two, three, which has an MO. It's really close to the distal, but it hasn't broken the distal wall, so we can't call it an MOD. So it's an MO amalgam filling. And on number four, there's just a distal amalgam filling. And over here, this white line here is showing the sinuses, okay? An FMX for the average adult, it's usually consisting of 18, 18 to 20 images. Generally, there are 14 periapicals and four to six bite wing views. The numbers may vary depending on the dentist's preference and the number of teeth present. The anterior region is where the number of images varies and the variable include the size of the sensor if you are using digital and the technique used. Now I do want to come back to this x-ray again to uh, remind you guys that the only vertical x-rays are in the anteriors and some x-rays are in the posterior. Okay, let's remember to mute your mic please unless you have a question. Please give me a call. I would appreciate it. The number is 407 3793. Thank you. Now I'm waiting for them to mute their mics. Okay, so here's a mounted FMX. This mounted FMX on the top picture here, you have digital. And on the bottom picture here, you have what we're, we've been doing is mounting a full mouse set of x rays. So when you take the digital with the sensor, it'll mount it for you. What you have to uh, pay attention to is where the computer is telling you where to go. That's the difference because if the computer is already set to start on bite wings or posteriors or wherever it's set to, that's where you need to begin. Whereas the FMX, you pretty much have uh, your choice of where to begin, okay? But What's important is a sequence because a sequence is going to help you uh, take images quicker and stay uh, not uh, repeating x-rays, which some of you did. Intraoral imaging techniques, whether using conventional film, digital sensor, or phosphor plates, there are two basic techniques for obtaining periapical images. We have the paralleling or the bisecting. The American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial and the American Association of Dental Schools recommend the use of the paralleling technique because it provides the most accurate image with the least amount of radiation exposure to the patient. In some situations, however, such as a shallow mouth, a shallow plate, or tori, the operator may need to use the bisecting technique. So at this point, we are using paralleling and uh, sometime either next week or uh, the week after, we are going to take some bisecting x-rays also so you can see that uh, you really need those XCP rims unless, again, in cer certain situations, as I mentioned. And here is a, um, a figure 41.5 that shows intraoral x-ray techniques. A is a bisecting and B is a paralleling, okay? So again, A, you're gonna put the film in the patient's mouth, they're gonna have to hold it or you're gonna use um, some of the, um, I showed you the foam uh, placement, I showed you the snap array, and I also showed you the bite wing tab. And then in B is where you guys have been using the XCP rings. So there are five basic rules to the paralleling technique. Image receptor placement, you're gonna position the image receptor so that it will cover the correct teeth to be examined. Uh, the position 
must be positioned parallel to the long axis of the tooth. The image receptor and the appropriate holder must be placed away from the teeth and toward the middle of the mouth. So I've told you guys that don't be up close to the teeth. You should be in the middle of the mouth. Vertical angulation, the central ray of the X-ray beam must be directed perpendicular to the image receptor and the long axis of the tooth. Horizontal angulation, the central ray of the X-ray beam must be directed through the contact areas between the teeth. And central ray, the X-ray beam must be centered on the image receptor to ensure that all areas are exposed. Okay, so again, those are the five basic rules. And here is another figure 41.8. Uh, uh, it shows the position of the film sensor tooth position indicator device, central ray of the X-ray beam and the paralleling technique which is the film sensor and the long axis of the tooth are parallel. And the central ray known as the CR is perpendicular to the tooth and the film sensor. An increased distance, 16 inches is required. For those of you that uh, do not know the term parallel, it means extending in the same direction, never crossing or converging. And perpendicular is when two planes form a right angle. Now here is a diagram of x-rays, which you'll find in your 41.9, okay? Here they're showing you the film. This is the cone, okay, the edge of the cone. Here's the central ray, and this is parallel. So what happens is if you're not parallel, you're gonna get cone uh, overlapping. And I've told you guys that you have to make sure it's dead in the circle. So you need to check that. You also might get something that's called cone cutting. So here is a picture of cone cutting. This is where your circle of the PID is not in your target of the XCP ring. Okay, so you miss this corner over here. That's why it's all white. I do want to point out that this is a bridge, okay, and this is an abutment right here. This is the Pontec, the missing tooth. And this is the other abutment. These, this is where the bridge holds. It looks like it might be extending also. It's hard to tell because again, cone cutting. Again, these are your sinuses, okay? So this is what helps you guys mount x-rays. And I've told you this already. Sinuses are on the maxillary. Also, the roots on the maxillary are more close together than the roots of the mandibular, which are more split apart. Patient preparation. The patient who's having dental images taken should be seated after the room has been prepared and infection control procedures completed. So we went over that yesterday in lab. Exposure sequence for image receptor placement. You should plan an exposure sequence or a definite order for periapical image receptor placement when you're exposing images. So when you're working with film without a planned exposure sequence, you are more likely to omit an area or expose the same area twice. So some of you guys did that yesterday. You didn't have a plan in mind, so you lost your way of your sequence. You need to have a plan. I'm going to start with my anterior, so take the top, go to the bottom. Or I'm going to start on my bite wings. Start on the right, go to the left. So when you don't have a plan, you're all over the place, and that's why uh, a few of you were not able to finish within the 15 minutes, and a few of you got lost. We will work on that. Now, this does not occur as easily when using direct digital imaging because the image most recently exposed a computer screen. So again, an FMX is, it could be anywhere from 18 to 20 images. So anterior exposure sequence. When exposing periapical views with the paralleling technique, you always want to start with the anterior teeth, canines and incisors, because the size of the anterior image receptor, number one, is small and easier to pace, place for the patient to tolerate. Patients more easily adapt to the anterior image receptor holder, and patients are less likely to gag with anterior image receptor placement. The recommended sequence for the RIN XCP instruments is as follows. So you begin with the maxillary right canine, which is number six. Expose all the maxillary anterior teeth from right to left. 
and you end with tooth number 11. Then you move down to the lower arch. So you just flip the blue XCP ring. You start on the left canine number 22. You expose all of the mandibular anterior teeth from left to right. And you finish on the right canine tooth number 27. So it is always uh, important for you to start on the same sequence. And you're going to notice that if you always start on the same sequence, your time is going to get better. So here are your anterior periapical film placement. And you want to, when you get a chance, really take a look in your uh, Kindle uh, or in your red shelf and look at figure 411 because this is how you can identify when you're mounting how the teeth should look. So here's letter A. You got the entire crown and the two to uh, of canine, including apex and surrounding structures. The interproximal alveolar bone and mesial contact of canine, the lingual cusp of the first premolar usually obscures distal contact of canine. So that's what's happening over here. Okay. And then letter B, you have an incisor. Okay. So entire, again, entire crown and roots of one lateral and one central incisor. It includes the apexes of teeth and surrounding structures. You can see the interproximal alveolar bone between central and lateral contact areas, the mesial and distal contact areas and surrounding regions of bone. The mesial contacts of adjacent central incisor and adjacent canine. Okay, so you can see basically interproximal areas. And the most important thing to remember on any periapical, periapical is don't cut off the crowns and make sure you get the apex, okay? So, and now these are the lower. So remember the top face down because just like the mouth and the bottom should be, the crown should be facing up. So here are the lowers. Here on letter C, you have a mandibular canine exposure. And letter D, you have a mandibular incisor exposure. Okay, so again, please look in your, uh, your book to read the entire contents. So you're all on the posterior, you're always going to begin with the premolar view before the molar for the following reasons. Premolar image receptor placement is easier for the patient to tolerate than the molar. Premolar exposure is less likely to bring on the gag reflex. With the paralleling technique, eight posterior image receptor placements are used. Four maxillary exposures and four mandibular exposures. You want to begin with the maxillary right quadrant. You want to have all your XCP uh, rings uh, uh, already assembled. Expose the premolar view, teeth four and five first, then the molar view, teeth one, two, and three. Without resembling the XCP instrument, move to the mandibular left quadrant. So remember what I told you, upper right, flip to the lower left. And then you're going to expose the premolar view, teeth number 20 and 21 first, and then the molar 17, 18, and 19. Then you're going to move to the maxillary left quadrant, uh, you can have either another XCP already assembled or you take off the one you just used and make sure you move the bar and the rim. And now you're going to expose the premolar film, uh, number 12 and 13, and then you're going to move to 14, 15, and 16. Flip the XCP rim and uh, finish with the mandibular right, 28 and 29, and then 30, 31, and 32. So it should look like this. So here is your maxillary, okay? This is your maxillary left, and then this is your maxillary right, okay? And again, it's just like before, we want to see all the uh, apexes, okay, and the crowns, all right? You know on the top, they're the top because here's the sinuses, okay? Here you can see it a little bit. On the bottom, you have lower right on letter C, lower left on letter D. Okay, again, same thing, crowns to the apex. Now, when you're using dental x-ray film, the white side of the film always faces the teeth. I've told you that before. Anterior films are always placed vertically, posterior horizontally. I also told you that before. The identification uh, dot on the film is always placed in the slot, dot in the slot. 
always position the film holder away from the teeth and toward the middle of the mouth. Always center the film over the areas to be examined and always place the film parallel to the long axis of the teeth. So all these things you've heard before because um, I've mentioned it to you basically from day one. What you have to do is retain. If anything, please take a screenshot of this slide right here so you guys always remember that this is the way you need to take x-rays. At this point, I'm going to ask, does anybody have any questions? No. No? Okay, so we're going to continue. I'm also going to have a little help here from Ms. Croston, okay, our other dental instructor. So she's going to continue. Please stop us if you have any questions. If not, we'll stop at a stopping point to see if anybody has any questions. All right, learning objectives. Lesson 41.2, bisecting and biking techniques. First off, discuss the bisecting technique, including the following. Identify the types of image receptors holders that can be used with the bisecting technique. Two, describe the result of incorrect horizontal angulation. Three, describe the result of incorrect vertical angulation. Identify the image receptor size used in bisecting technique. Discuss the bite wing technique, including the following. So this is where you guys are able to ask us questions. Explain the basic rules for the bite wing technique. Name the recommended vertical angulation for all bite wing exposures. Bisecting technique. The bisection of the angle technique is based on a geometric principle of equally dividing a triangle. In contrast to paralleling, te paralleling technique in which you move the image receptor away from the teeth to make the film and the teeth parallel. The bisecting technique places the film directly against the teeth to be exposed. Thus, the film sensor and the teeth are not parallel but are at an angle. Bisecting technique. technique. With the bisecting technique, the angle formed by the long axis of the teeth and the image receptor is bisected into two equal parts, and the X-ray beam is directed perpendicular to the bisecting line. Perpendicular, keep in mind, means at a right angle to the film. The major disadvantage of this technique is that the image is dimensionally distorted. So notice in these images, it's showing you just a little bit about what we just discussed. So you have an image A, you have an imaginary bisector, okay? You have the long axis of the tooth, and you're seeing where the red is showing how to bisect it. This right here is a central ray particular to the bisector. In image B, you're having the imaginary bisector here, and then your comb beam over here, so B in the tooth. Image receptor holders. When the bisecting technique is being used, you may see operators asking the patient to hold the film with his or her fingers to stabilize the film in the mouth. This practice is definitely not recommended. Holding the film sensor exposes the patient's hand and finger to unnecessary radiation. Remember Mod, mod 110, Rinkin. Image receptor holders. Available types of image receptor holders for the bisecting technique include the BAI, bisecting angle instrument. Dense ply, the REN, your holders. The stable bite block, dense ply, REN, your holders. The easy grip holder, dense ply, REN, previously called the snap array. So from your lab yesterday, you were taught the foam, you were taught the RENs, and you were taught the snap array. So this right here would be your snap array, if you're looking at the image here. So I believe you were showing this yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday or the last week sometime, but I, I did show okay, it. Okay, so this sensor holder for both anterior and posterior. So the thing that you can define here is that blue is going to be your anterior, yellow is going to be your posterior. Angulation of position indicator device. And the bisecting technique, 
the angulation of the PID is critical. Angulation is the term that is used to describe the alignment of the central ray of the X-ray beam in the horizontal and vertical planes. Angulation can be changed by moving the PID in a horizontal or vertical direction. BAI instruments with aiming rings dictate the proper PID angulation. So, guys, this is easy. It's hit the bullseye. Horizontal angulation. Horizontal angulation refers to the positioning of the tube head and direction of the central ray in a horizontal or side to side plane. Horizontal angulation remains the same whether you are using the paralleling or the bisecting technique. So as you're seeing right here, this is the tube head. I know you guys are familiar with this now. So what they're saying is side to side, as in you can move that, okay? Correct horizontal angulation. With correct horizontal angulation, the central ray is directed perpendicular to the curvation of the arch and through the contact areas of the teeth. So as you see here, this is your beam head right here. Okay, this is the end of the tube, this is the end of the tube, and see how it's bisecting the teeth? Incorrect horizontal angulation. Incorrect horizontal angulation results in overlapped, unopened contact areas. So that's when you're gonna see it looks like your teeth are just on top of each other. Dentists really need to see what's going on in between. A view with overlap contact areas cannot be used to examine the interproximal areas of the teeth. Incorrect horizontal angulation. So as you're seeing, when we're telling you, put that bullseye right there, straight on it, the way this is kind of going, this is gonna do what? It's gonna cut off the teeth and it's gonna cause that overlapping. And in your next image, you're gonna see what that would look like. So see how right here, you cannot see in between this. I see this tooth is here, I see this tooth is here, but I don't know what's going on between because I honestly cannot figure out what's the in between, okay? Vertical angulation refers to the positioning of the PID in a vertical or up and down plane. Differs according to the X-ray technique that is being used as follows. With the paralleling technique, the vertical angulation of the central ray is directed perpendicular to the image receptor and the long axis of the tooth. With the bicep technique, the vertical angulation is determined by the imagery bisector. The central ray is directed perpendicular to the imaginary bisector. With the bite wing technique, the vertical angulation is predetermined. The central ray is directed at a plus 10 degrees to the occlusal plane. Here is an example of what it means. Vertical angulation. So you see how the tube head is pointed down. See how the tube head is pointed up. Correct vertical angulation. Correct vertical angulation results in an image that is the same length as the tooth. So here is what it's recommended. So you're looking at your canines. You're seeing how far up, plus 45, plus 55, down, minus 20, minus 30. Molars, plus 20, plus 30. And again, remember, maxillary. And then again, minus 5, minus 0, mandibular. <clears throat> so I do want to say, class, that probably you guys haven't realized that on the tube head, somewhere on the side over here, there's an indicator, okay, to let you know when you're taking uh, these measurements over here, okay, the degrees. So next time you come into lab, I want you to look at the tube head because, you know, we didn't really focus on that before because I just wanted you to set put the PID straight on the ring, but it's important, especially uh, when you're doing the bisecting that you know your angulation is a little bit too much or a little bit too little. 
okay? And how to know that is from the tube head. And again, it will have the degrees on the side of the tube head. I lost my mouse somewhere. Okay, there's my mouse. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back, thank you. All right, any questions at this point? No. No. Okay. We're going to continue. All right. And incorrect vertical angulation. Incorrect vertical angulation results in an image that is not the same length as a tooth being x-rayed. So that's what we would call elongated. The image appears longer or shorter or, like I said, elongated or foreshortened images are not diagnostic. And that is also in pr proper um, of the tube head. Foreshortened images result from excessive vertical angulation. Elongated images result from insufficient vertical angulation. This is what it would look like for a foreshortened. So if you notice here, this person's incisors don't have any roots, do they? The reason why is the way that the cone beam was placed. And the reason is because now you've foreshortened it shortened it. This is what you would see for an elongated image. So this person looks like they have roots that go on for miles. They do not. This is because improper position of the cone beam. Do you see how the length of it? Mm -hmm. So image receptor size and placement. In the bisecting technique, the image receptor is placed close to the crowns of the teeth to be x-rayed and extends at an angle into the palate or the floor of the mouth. The image receptor should extend beyond the incisal or occlusal aspect of the teeth by about one eighth of an inch. Film holders for the bisecting of the angle technique include some with alignment indicators and are available commercially. Patient positioning. So the greatest thing I want to tell you about this before I even read what the slide says is you have to remember their heads move. <laughs> so now we're going to go. The patient's mid sagittal plane should be perpendicular to the floor. This means that the patient's head is upright from maxillary films and is tipped back slightly for the mandibular arch. Now remember, you can tell your patient, hey, look to the sky. So that helps you that way. Hey, head down to your chest. Their heads do move. Size number two image receptor is used in both the anterior in a vertical position and the posterior in a horizontal position regions. Only three films are needed in the maxillary anterior region because all four maxillary incisors can be imaged on number two film sensors if the arch is wide. So that's basically telling you that a size two film is just a little bit bigger and helps you get more images in the one picture. If the arch is narrow, it may be necessary to use four number one film sensors. The number one is the smaller. Mm -hmm. Beam alignment. X-ray beam is directed to pass between contacts of teeth, being x-rayed in horizontal dimension, just as it is in parallel in technique. The vertical angle, however, must be directed at a 90 degree angle to the imagery bisecting line. Too much vertical angulation produces images that are too short, and if you remember, foreshortened. Too little vertical angulation results in images that are too long, elongated. The beam must be centered to help prevent cone cutting. So again, guys, these are bullseyes. Bite wing technique. A bite wing view shows the crowns and interproximal areas of the maxillary and mandibular teeth and the areas of crustal bone on a single image. These are probably going to be your best x-rays because they're going to diagnose decay more than anything. Bite wing views are used to detect interproximal caries, tooth decay, and are particularly useful in detecting early carious lesions that are not clinically evident. So in other words, you can have a patient come in and see that everything looks great, but once I get that x-ray showing me in between your teeth, I know you haven't been flossing. Bite wing views are also useful in examining crustal bone levels between the teeth also because you haven't been flossing. 
bite wing technique. A bite wing view shows the current. I already did that one. The basic principles of the bite wing technique are the image receptor is placed in the mouth parallel to the crowns of both the upper and lower teeth. The image receptor is stabilized when the patient bites on the bite wing tab or bite wing film holder. Again, bites, it's a bite wing. The central ray of the X beam is directed through the contacts of the teeth using a plus 10 degrees of vertical angulation. So this is showing you here. So if you look here, this is your beam, this is your cone, and see how it's going here? So it is doing what? Bisecting, vertical angulation, and gonna get what's going in that inner proximal. Image receptor holder and bite wing tab. In the bite wing technique, a film holder or bite wing tab is used to stabilize the image receptor. When using a REN type of image receptor, red is the universal color for bite wing holders. So I know you were shown the foam, I know you're shown snap array, and you were also shown this. Those are all forms of it, but red is your universal color. This right here is your bite tab. The reason why they're calling it this is this here is your film, and this right here is a little type sticker that comes around it and just places out. So this is going to be more for your patient that is more of a gagger. We're actually going to be taking those x-rays uh, with the bite wing tab probably either next week or the week after, just so you guys have an idea of how to take a bite wing x-ray uh, bisecting technique wise. Yes, this, this one is a great one to train on because if you can get this down, then you can get any of them down because now you've learned how to aim. Angulation of position indicator device. The angulation of the PID is a critical in the bite wing technique. The film holding instrument and aiming rings provide the proper angulation. When a bite wing tab is used, however, the operator must determine both the horizontal and the vertical angulation. So that was the picture previously, previously and that is the one that you're gonna learn how your angles are. Exposure for image receptor placement. Bite wing images are always parallel views, regardless of technique used for the periapical images. The number of bite wing films necessary is based on the curvature of the arch and the number of the teeth present in the posterior areas. So what that means is that you might have a smaller person with a size two film and be able to get it in one image versus two images. The curvature of the arch often differs in the premolar and molar areas. If curvature of arch differs, it is possible to open all the posterior contacts areas on a single bite wing view. Consistently, two bite wing views are usually exposed on each side of the arch. Exposure for image. Because the curvature of the arch differs in most adult patients, a total of four bite wing films are exposed. One right premolar, one right molar, one left premolar, one left molar. All right, any questions at this time? No. no. Okay. I'm gonna All right, so we're gonna continue then. Uh, learning objectives, occlusal techniques, special dental needs, and mounting radiographs. We're gonna explain the technique for occlusal radiographs, describe techniques for managing patients with special medical needs. We're gonna describe techniques for um, not only with special dental needs, but including a hypersensitive gag reflex. We're gonna describe the appearance of the most common dental image technique errors and explain the two methods of mounting dental radiographs. So starting with the occlusal, it's used to examine large areas of the upper or lower jaw. The technique is so named because the patient bites or occludes the entire film. It's usually size four. Sometimes we use size two in a child. Now I will tell you this, 
that these images, I don't really see them anymore in dental offices. OK, we used to take it a lot um, when Pano wasn't around. Um, just because it gives a whole view of the maxillary or the mandibular arch. <clears throat> now it can be used for the following purpose. Locate, retain roots or extracted of extracted teeth. Locate supernumerary, which are extra uninterrupted or impacted teeth. It can locate salivary stones in the duct of the submandibular gland. Locate fractures of the maxilla and mandible. mandible. Examine the area of the cleft palate and measure changes in the size and shape of the maxilla or mandible. The basic principles is that the film is positioned with the white side facing the arch exposed. The film is placed in the mouth between the occlusal surfaces of the maxillary and mandibular teeth. The film is stabilized when the patient gently closes on the surface of the film. Patients with special medical needs, radiographic examination techniques often must be modified to accommodate patients with special needs. You must be prepared to alter your radiographic technique to meet the specific need of the individual patient. Physical disabilities. A person with a physical disability may have problems with vision, hearing, or mobility. You must make every effort to meet the individual needs of such patients. In many cases, a family member or caretaker accompanies the person with a physical disability to the dental office. You can ask this person to assist you with communicating or with the physical needs of the patient. Please don't talk to your patient like they're dumb either, okay? They just have a physical impairment. Um, especially like the hard of hearing, you know, you can make signs. I've done that, you know, like uh, letting the patient know I'm, I will be wearing my mask, but if I tap you on the shoulder, that means open. Or if I use my fingers uh, with a closing um, gesture, that means to close. And I'll show you more of that when you're in lab, so that way you have an idea exactly of what I mean. Vision impairment. If your patient is blind or visually impaired, you must communicate using clear, verbal explanations. You must keep your patient informed of what you are doing and explaining each procedure before performing it. You must never gesture to another person in the presence of a person who is blind. Blind persons perceive that you are talking behind their backs. So be careful about that because they know, believe it or not. Hearing impairment. If your patient is deaf or hearing impaired, you have several options. You may ask a caregiver to act as an interpreter using gestures or use written instructions. And if the patient can read lips, you will need to remove your mask, face the patient, and speak clearly and slowly. Mobility impairment. If your patient is in a wheelchair and does not have use of the lower limbs, you may need to expose the necessary views with the patient seated in the wheelchair. If your patient does not have the use of the upper limbs and a film holder cannot be used to stabilize the films in the mouth, you may ask the patient's caregiver to assist with holding the film. This person must wear a lead apron and a thyroid collar during exposure of the films. You must never hold the film for a patient during an exposure. Listen, I'll, it, that is true. On occasion, you might have to do it, okay? But don't do it on a, on a regular basis, okay? And here's just a picture of someone in a wheelchair. Developmental disabilities, a substantial impairment of mental or physical functioning that occurs before adulthood and lasts indefinitely. That would be your autism, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and mental impairment. A person with a developmental disability may have problems with coordination or comprehension of instruction. You may have difficulties in obtaining intraoral views. If coordination or comprehension is a problem, mild sedation may be useful. It is important that you recognize situations in which the patient cannot tolerate Intraoral film sensor placement and exposure. Intraoral views should not be tempted in these patients. Such exposure results only in non-diagnostic images and needless radiation exposure of the patient. Extraoral images such as lateral jaw and panoramic views may be used. 
Your patients with special dental needs, often you may need to modify the basic imaging techniques to accommodate patients with special dental needs, including edentulous, with me, which means people without teeth. It, endodontic patients, okay, we usually need to see the ends of the root in the, uh, in the gum, okay, for that x-ray. And then, of course, your pediatric patients, which are your children. So again, edentulous patients, we do take x-rays, even though you might be saying, well, Ms. Perez, why are we taking patients on people without no teeth? Well, do we know if they have any retained root tips, impacted teeth, any lesions, cysts, or tumors? We need to identify any objects embedded in the bone, and we need to observe the quantity and health of the bone. So those are the reasons why we take x-rays on edentulous patients. A radiographic examination of an edentulous patient may include a panoramic radiograph, periapicals, or a combination of occlusal and periapical. Radiographic images must be taken in all areas of the arch whether or not teeth are present. Because no teeth are present, the distortion inherent in the bisecting technique does not interfere with diagnostic intrabony conditions. So for partially edentulous patients, Image receptor holding instruments can be used by placing a cotton roll on the bite block where the crowns of the missing teeth would have been. So that's another thing I'm going to show you guys when we come back into lab, how to take x-rays on people that don't have teeth. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, those are the, probably your toughest ones, okay? But uh, most doctors, they do allow the panoramic x-ray and then um, there are some doctors that if they don't have the panoramic, then you're going to have to take what's called a FMX or occlusals where this comes in. So as you can see here, these are some occlusal images. And you're saying, whoa, Ms. Perez, how do I mount this? Again, use your landmarks. Your landmarks on your top are your sinuses, okay? And then the landmark on the bottom, here is your mandibular bone. On the bottom, it's always shaped like a U, so you should be able to identify that when you're gonna mount x-rays. Now, on your pedi pediatric patient, which is your children, we detect conditions of teeth and bones, we show changes related to caries and trauma, and we evaluate growth and development. We explain the x-ray procedures you are about to perform in terms that the child can easily understand, Please avoid baby talk and use positive reinforcement with children. Now, for example, you can refer to the tube head as a camera, the lead apron as a coat, and the image as a picture. Exposure factors, milliampere kilovoltage must be reduced because of the smaller size of the pediatric patient. The shorter exposure time will reduce the effect of blurring if the child should move. So here is a picture. Again, notice how dead on the cone is to the XCP ring, okay? And that's what you guys really need to work on, whether it's an adult or a child. Endodontic patient, it is often, uh, to, it often is difficult to obtain accurate image during endodontic root canal treatment because of the rubber dam clamp, endodontic instruments, or filling material extending from the tooth. The endo ray, a two film holder can be used to aid in positioning the film during this portion of the root canal procedure. This holder fits around a rubber dam clamp and allows space for endodontic instruments and filling materials to protrude from the tooth, and it looks like this. <clears throat> I actually showed you one like this, but in the color green. Again, learn how to mount it, okay? You know, this is the time for you guys to perfect your XCP uh, rinse how to mount every single one, you really need to uh, work on that. Sometimes I don't see everybody working on it as best as they can. And then when you go and get to uh, get ready to take x-rays, you're still struggling because of the mounting part of your XCP rings. Now, radiographs for the endodontic patient, a diagnostic quality endodontic film must have the following qualities. The tooth is centered on the film, and at least two millimeters of bone beyond the apex of the tooth is visible. The image is as anatomically accurate as possible. 
<clears throat> the pre-operative diagnostic view and the post-operative view should be taken with the standard paralleling technique and with the use of a film holding device. So we really want to take a picture when it comes to root canals. We need before and after pictures. Now here's your gagging patients. To help prevent the gag reflex, you must convey a confident attitude. If the patient senses nervousness, a psychogenic stimulus may result and cause the gag reflex. Be tolerant, patient, and understanding. As the patient becomes more tolerant with the procedure, the less likely the patient is to gag. I mentioned to you yesterday, there's different ways to control those gaggers. We have spray, we have, um, you know, I told you tell them to uh, breathe through their nose and wiggle their toes, things like that, you know. And also salt, believe it or not, I mentioned that to you guys uh, yesterday. Now, exposure sequency plays an important role in preventing the gag reflex. So this is super important. We talked about this before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anterior films are easier for the patient to tolerate and are less likely to elicit the gag reflex. With posterior, always expose the premolar before the molar. The maxillary uh, molar film placement is the one most likely to gag or uh, cause the gag reflex. For the patient with a hypersensitive gag reflex, you should expose the maxillary molars last. The other thing that I notice when I talk to my patients, I usually tell them if they can tolerate it once, we won't have to take the x-ray again. And usually they'll try to sit as, as sit as still as possible. But this is where you guys come in. You really need to move like lightning. Image receptor placement. Avoid the palate. When you place films in the maxillary posterior, do not slide them along the palate. Instead, position the film lingual to the teeth and then firmly bring the film into contact with the palatal tissues in a single motion. Demonstrate film placement. In the areas that are most likely to elicit the gag reflex, rub a finger along the tissues near the intended area of film placement while telling the patient this is where the film will be positioned. Then quickly position the film. Actually, I skip that part because once you put the finger in the patient's mouth, you also may gag them, so you don't want that to happen. Extreme cases. At times, you may encounter a patient with an uncontrollable gag reflex. In such patients, intraoral films are impossible to obtain. You must use extraoral radiographs such as panoramic or lateral jaw films. Dental imaging technique errors. Diagnostic quality radiographs are those that have been properly placed, exposed, and processed. Errors in any of these area, three areas may result in non-diagnostic films. Non-diagnostic films must be retaken, which results in additional exposure of the patient to ionizing radiation. And we talked about that like in first or second lecture. Mounting dental radiographs, recognizing anatomic landmarks, so to mount dental radiographs correctly, the dental system must be able to recognize the normal anatomic landmarks on intraoral radiographs. Process radiographs are arranged in anatomic order in holders called mounts. To make it easier for the dentist to view the films, the mount must always be labeled with the patient's name and the date that the radio, uh, radiographs were exposed. The dentist's name and address should also be on the mount. Selecting the mount. Mounts are available in many sizes with different numbers and sizes of windows to accommodate the number and size of views in the patient's radiographic survey. The mounts must often used for radiographic surveys are available in black, gray, and clear. And of course, we're using the clear. Methods of mounting. There are two methods used when mounting radiograph. Both methods rely on identification of the rays and both dot on the film. So this is like I tell you all the time. If the dot is not correct, your x-rays are not going to be right. Okay, so labial mounting method. The films are placed in the mount with the dot, raised dots facing up. So this is convex. This is what you guys are doing right now. That means that the American Dental Association recommends this method of mounting radiographs. Radiographs are viewed as if the view is looking directly at the patient. The patient's left side is on the viewer's right and the patient's right side is on the viewer's left. Lingual mounting method. 
radiographs are placed in the mount with the raised dots facing concave. So that means that you would uh, mount the x-rays from the back of the mount. With lingual mounting, with this method, radiographs as view as the view is inside the patient's mouth and is looking out. The patient's left side is on the view's left and the patient's right side is on the view's right. Note, it is critical to know how the dentist prefers to have radiographs mounted. Honestly, I think it depends on the mount that you're using, you know. That's how he, he will distinguish that how he wants the mounts, whether it's labial or lingual. Uh, guidelines, uh, handle film only by the edges, label and date the film mount before mounting the film. Include the patient's full name and date of exposure and the dentist's name. Work with clean, dry hands. Use a definite order for mounting films. And use a smile line to mount bite wing radiographs. I uh, usually mount bite wings first, so that way I can use it to uh, help me mount the top and the bottom. I mean, for beginners, I would say. At this point, I can mount whatever x-ray you give me first, you know? But for you guys, try to uh, use that order. And it's like a puzzle. You're going to match the teeth to that puzzle. Portable imaging, FDA has approved a portable battery powered machine that can be de taken directly to the patient. For operator safety, it has internal shielding materials and units are approved for use in many states, but not at all. Yeah, it's called the Nomad. Um, quite a few offices, and they, I don't have a picture on this PowerPoint, but you have it in your book. It looks like a x-ray gun. You uh, can carry that from uh, room to room. And uh, the only thing is that you really need to have a steady hand. Uh, when they first came out with it, it was very heavy. They're actually making it a little bit better. It is still a little bit heavy. If you don't have strength in your arm, you'll feel it. But you just basically bring up the, you know, it's like, like I said, it's like a gun. You bring it up to the XCP ring and you shoot it. Okay. But let's try not to use that as a, um, a reference because nobody wants to uh, hear us say we're going to use this gun and shoot an X-ray. You, we still want to say that, you know, we're going to take a film image or um, an x-ray or however you use it, but don't use the word gun or shoot, okay? So, with that said, at this point, do we have any questions? Nobody? No, ma'am, ma'am. 